I won't speak to you in English, although you can tell I, my native language is Greek. One of my favorite authors, Vladimir Nabokov, wrote once, my personal tragedy, the one that cannot and should not be anyone's concern, is that I abandoned my natural language, my natural idiom. And although I won't go as far as him to say that it is my personal tragedy, that one, I did abandon Greek and I adopted English, the language of science, of modern science. And I adopted English when I embarked on my intellectual and professional journey to study something that fascinated me for a long time. And that was the interaction between science and society. How do they relate to each other? How, through this interaction, moral boundaries are emerging for science and for society? In other words, I've been trying to study how the language of science and the language of society relate. Is this a tragic relationship of abandonment, or is it a, a relationship of symbiosis? And if the latter, what does it mean, really? How does it work? And what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is an illustration of that relationship, because I find the example of tonight much more interesting than many other, because it is about science made by non-scientists. Now, many of you in this beautiful room are calling yourself scientists, I guess, and we heard today a few scientists speaking. To do that, you started at an institution, you, got, you had tests, certificates, and you entered a community of experts, a closed-knit community, which has a particular language and a code. Now, in this closed net, we take pride, because science is important, and scientists are important. And without science, our lives wouldn't be as livable as they are, and our opportunities to flourish would be limited. And that's an important thing to remember. So, science and scientists are very important, but the question I want to put to you is, how would it be if I told you that non-scientists, any of you, ordinary people out there, can actually contribute to the development of scientific knowledge? How would it be if just ordinary people who don't understand the scientific method, the scientific thinking, people who never stepped foot in a lab that sequences people's DNA, they can make a significant contribution in the development of scientific knowledge? This is not bad science fiction. As we speak, there are millions of people, the ones you see here on this slide, around science, that are actually making important contributions to scientific development. Now, the phenomenon is called citizen science, and the people who do it, citizen scientists. And it's a hard thing to define, so I will try to use some examples to define it. But before I do that, I'll just try to... Uh, my remark is, when I use the word citizens, please don't think of citizen as in the sense of a membership to a state, rather, membership to the state of knowledge, or to the republic of knowledge. A republic in which we're all members, and in which we all have rights and responsibilities. Let me get to the examples. Citizen science comes in various forms. One such form is in crowds. Four and a half thousand people contributed their observations during a solar eclipse, which helped scientists understand why, during the solar eclipse, there is an eerie sense of cold wind on those observers. For a lot, many years, scientists were trying to understand that, but they couldn't. What they were missing is all these observations. Imagine four and a half thousand scientists making an observation. That's a lot to ask from scientists. Those citizens contributed that. In 2007, a group of astronomers developed Galaxy Zoom, an open platform where they uploaded pictures of galaxies, a lot of observable galaxies that we need to understand, but we have to classify first. They asked the public to help classify those galaxies, and they thought, well, there are going to be a few people maybe interested in this project. Who knows how many? In the first year, 150,000 people made over 50 million classifications. A lot of people got interested in this project. 
Galaxy Zoo is one of the very successful citizen science projects, has now moved to something that's called Zooniverse, which is a platform that hosts a lot of citizen science projects, from astronomy to physics to medicine, biology, and uh, many other areas. But citizen science come also in other smaller kind of constellations. These are the Hempels. The girls, the twins, were born with a disease. It took them two years to find out what the disease was. It looked bad, and the doctors eventually figured out that they suffered from the Neiman Pick C disease. There is no treatment. They probably wouldn't come to adolescence. It's the responsible gene for that is the one that controls our lipids. The parents are not scientists. They haven't gone to an institution that teaches science, and they don't have a degree in science. They were devoted, caring, curious, maybe desperate, and really convinced that they have to do something to help their kids. The girls are suffering from a rare disease, so not really in the center of the scientific interest. They pushed very hard, they fundraised, they networked with scientists, they collaborated with scientists, they were even able to come up themselves after their own study with a compound, cyclodextrin, that convinced eventually some scientists to put it in a clinical trial. The clinical trial is today funded by the National Institutes of Health in the United States, and we still have to know the result, but still, it is a contribution to their kids, but also to the generalizable knowledge, to the tree of scientific knowledge. Kim Godsell is an extreme athlete. While she was training for Ironman, she started having instability. She went to doctors. They diagnosed her eventually with two diseases, probably rare again, and told her that she simply had bad luck. Well, she was not very satisfied with that. She needed to do something, and she convinced herself that she needed a unifying diagnosis of how can one have two diseases at the same time, and we don't know what to do about it. She invested hundreds of hours to study genetics, not in an institution, not in a lab, studying sources that she found and trying to connect the dots. And she eventually did, to the surprise of the top, ex top experts in the field. Today, she says, her contribution not only helped her to improve her life, but also to produce that little tiny bit of knowledge that can be generalized and help others. My last example, is Sarah Rigare. Sarah is a Parkinson's patient, and she also calls herself citizen scientist. She has to take six medications, prescription medications, six times a day, at five different intervals, in six different combinations. You can do the math. Well, what Sarah says is that that's a lot of self-care. All the blue dots on that graph are the 8,765 hours that she self-cares. The red dot, it's the one hour that she sees her physician in a year. What she says is that she doesn't want one more hour or a lot more red dots. What she argues is that in all those blue dots, there is a lot of knowledge that she can collect. And that knowledge can help her, can also be used for other patients. Now, this is a kind of knowledge we don't capture, because she goes to the doctor only for that hour, and she tells him or her that she took the pills or she feels better or worse. Her point and her advocacy has been to encourage patients to collect this data, to make, collect the observations, and put them back into the pot of data that scientists can analyze. The reason that Sarah is arguing that this can happen, and she's trying to motivate the Parkinson's community and many other patients for that, is because with the technology we have today, that is possible. We all walk around with our smartphones, we can take pictures, we can measure things, we all have sensors, or most of us. And globally, we know that there are more smartphones, active subscriptions in smart and, and mobile phones, than people on the planet. So that's not just a few people, there's lots of people with the technology. We're mostly on the internet, most of us on the internet. We have technology, we have connectivity, and there's something else that's happening. There is a social trend about empowerment. 
how we, as scientists, citizens, patients, whatever capacity we have, can become more in control of our lives and become more active participants to decisions that matter about our lives. And these different things that are happening have created a very fertile environment for this movement of citizen science to emerge and also to flourish. But you can ask the question, well, I told you already that science is great, it has done so much for us, does it really need all those people doing things of that sort? Maybe the Hempels or Kim Goodsell are extreme cases and that's welcome, but do we have to systematically go out there and encourage people to do that stuff? Does science need that? And more importantly, does society need that? And I'll answer the question, I hope. We live in a society absolutely dependent on science and technology, and yet we have clearly and cleverly arrayed things so that almost no one understands science and technology. That's a clear prescription for disaster. Scientific literacy around the world is not great, even in countries that produce some very serious science. At the same time, science becomes more complex, and we more dependent on science, and yet we don't understand it. Lots of people don't understand it. Citizen science and this engagement with the scientific activity, this hands-on engagement, can actually contribute to filling this gap. Science is important for democracy, and I hope you agree with me on that, but I'll explain quickly why I think it's really important. Democracy is something that we all participate in, or we ought to participate in. We have to make decisions collectively about scientific matters and societal matters. And the important thing we have to do is to be able to think critically and not be swayed by things that are not real, by non-facts, etc. Science, the scientific thinking, the scientific method, the critical eye that science introduces to the way we approach things can help us do that, can also help us think and probably understand that sometimes true things are counterintuitive. And that's always a little harder on us. But for democracy, we would need to develop those skills. And because democracy is something that is for all of us, we can't expect that the tools of thinking, of critical thinking, and of these possibilities of um, evaluation are only kept for the experts. We all have to be able to deal with those tools. Out on the edge, you see all kinds of things you can't see from the center. Big, undreamed of things, the people on the edge see them first. If you have people on the edge of science, they can see things. The rare disease people can see things. Sarah Regare can see things. She's not in the center of science. She's out there. And she can imagine things that it would be very useful if those scientists in the center were able to understand. There is insight on the edge that is necessary for the center. This language of the side, of the edge, can be useful to the language of the center. And it is an opportunity with citizen science to bring it in. And therefore, it's an opportunity to enrich science if people from the edge are coming to the center. It is therefore important not only for society, not only for democracy, but also for science itself to encourage and respect and protect citizen science. And in fact, in my view, it's important for all of us, no matter what role we play. And if it is so important, we also have to protect citizen science from some risks that it might run. And there are two risks. One is the risk to be hijacked. Citizen science has becoming fashionable. It is becoming fashionable. Because who wouldn't like a big crowd of four and a half thousand people or of a million people doing a task voluntarily, giving data voluntarily, without asking to be paid, without asking anything, just doing it for the, uh, for the interest of science, for the interest of scientific knowledge. It's a great thing. So there are a lot of interests coming in there. If science, citizen science gets hijacked, if people are exploited, it won't work. If people don't, are not given credit for what they do, it won't work. 
If people's interest of altruism to help science, to help our society become better, are hijacked by other interests that are not aligned with the motivations of citizen scientists, it won't work. And that would be a huge loss. So we have to protect this phenomenon. We have to protect the participation of all citizens of science from that particular risk of being hijacked. But citizen science runs also another risk, a little bit more subtle, but equally important. This is the risk of suffocation. Our standard science, our mainstream science, the one we take pride on and we like and has helped us so much, is a closed system. It has its own language, it has its own rules, and for the most part, that's a good thing. We don't want lousy science that changes its rules every now and then, but we want openness in science and inside the scientific community. We want openness that will allow science to see its own blind spots, because it has some. That means openness to accept that those people from the edge have something important to contribute to the center. And therefore means that it won't suffocate that activity that's coming towards the center. And for that, we don't even need to invent a new moral imperative, a new ethic. It's actually a very fundamental thing in our morality, in our humanity, to have people, all of us, participate in a valuable social activity like science. And you won't have to go too far to discover this, it's already inscribed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. One specific article, which even if you're familiar with international law and human rights, you might have not actually paid attention to, because nobody did, is this one, Article 27, which recognizes that we all have this right to participate in the cultural life, to community to enjoy the arts, and to share in the scientific advancements and its benefits. And while we are all interested in the benefit, we have paid little attention in the importance of sharing in the scientific advancement. It's now a big opportunity to have citizen science and that participation in the making of scientific advan advancements, giving us all the hope we probably need. And I hope we won't miss this chance. Thank you very much.